Book Talk begins at 13 minutes and 28 seconds. Welcome to Craft Lit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 624, Saving Genius. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Well, hello. How are you? I, I am. <laughs> How very philosophical of me. I have a lot of good things to share with you this week. The first is a blog post by Andrew. I don't know if I ever shared this with you. I should have if I didn't. As you may know, Andrew has been on our school board for the last, I think it's now six years, and maybe seven years. And like all school boards around the country in the United States, there have been times where it's been quite fraught. But Andrew is a real proponent of fairness and equity. And also the same belief that I have that people really just want to know that someone is driving the bus. It's my story about the New York City subway that if they come on and tell you that there's a police action at the next station and you're going to be stalled in the middle of a tunnel with no lights for a while, but they'll let you know as soon as they know something, people stay calm. If nobody comes on the radio, it's a feeding frenzy. It's bad. So to that end, Andrew wrote a blog post about how they have been handling book challenges for the the school district. That's not the only thing that his post is about, but it does encompass that. So I thought I would give you guys a link in case you're interested in reading. I know he's posting all the time on our Facebook group. I'm sure he would love to see you over on Substack as well. And to that end, also, listener Jean, hi, Jean, sent me a link to another Substack, which is the name of it is based on a Zen Buddhist belief or dictum that before enlightenment, you have to chop wood and carry water. And then after enlightenment, you have to chop wood and carry water, which I thought was pretty good and fits right in with Terry Pratchett's Buddhist e character from the Discworld novels as well. Anyway, Chop Wood Carry Water is a substack written by Jessica Craven. You can get it as an email in your inbox. And every day she has something small, like five to seven minutes, something small that you can do to make the world a better place. And and in doing so, hopefully lower your anxiety and mine. And and yay, that would be great. So that sent me, obviously, down a rabbit hole. And that rabbit hole included several things that I don't know if I've mentioned to you. I know one I did. But the the first one I'm going to mention I'm not sure about. Ocean Cleanup started by, he was a teenager when he started it. I think he's Dutch. His name is Boyan Slat. And he's extraordinary and has pulled off extraordinary things. And I remember I started paying attention to them three or four years ago. And at the time... Things were progressing, but they weren't really working yet. And so it was kind of hard to watch because you really wanted it to do well. Their their big activity was get rid of the, the Great Pacific garbage patch, which I've linked to a video explaining that it's not really a patch. It's much more complicated than that, which is one of the reasons why it's hard to clean up. But one of the things that Ocean Cleanup and Boyan Slat learned in doing their research before imp- trying to implement a solution was that 80% of the trash in the ocean is coming from rivers. Makes sense, right? So if you can both clean up what's already there and at the same time stop the flow of new trash going into the ocean, you have a double win and eventually you'll get to a position where it's really just maintenance and that's much cheaper. I didn't realize in the last two years how 
fast they'd grown. I'm linking you to their YouTube channel, a couple of videos on them, but also to their YouTube channel itself, because one of the places that they have in the last year set up one of their river cleaning projects is Los Angeles, California. And I did not expect that they would get there that soon. And it was really interesting because they interviewed some people <laughs> on the bike path next to this. It's a man-made river, river creek, Bologna Creek in, in LA, southern LA, just south of Venice Beach and Marina Del Rey. They interviewed some people who were like, yeah, I just, I didn't understand what was going on. I thought it was kind of stupid, but there's no trash on my beach anymore. And, and it was like a neighborhood of converts. It was really lovely to see. Are the processes that they've got 100% foolproof? Of course not. Nothing ever will be. But is it making a massive dent? Uh, yeah, it is. And they are trying to find and have found products that can be made using this recovered plastic so that it's not just more landfill. There are other solutions, including, I've linked you out to also a video on how people, oh, I watched so many videos. I think this one is, is it in Guatemala? I can't remember. It's south of me right now. They are making bricks out of plastic trash, like Lego bricks that then can be used for construction. And was it Cote d'Ivoire? I think it was Ivory Coast asked them for support. And so they went and built a school in like a couple of weeks. And because it's six inch thick plastic, like solid plastic walls that don't melt, they're actually keeping the schoolhouse cooler and, and they're easy to clean and it uses up garbage. And I was so excited. And I'm sure that there are problems with trying to keep things clean for the people who are making the bricks. Because, of course, trash waste has to be a cleaned, which can take a lot of water. It can also create toxic fumes, depending on how you work. I know in the video that I watched, they were wearing the big respirator masks in one part of the, the factory floor. So, yay. But it sure seems like this goes back to, what was it, 12 years ago when I had thought, I'm going to take all the water bottles that I can find, fill them with dirt, and use that to build a chicken coop in the desert. So it'd be like fake adobe walls, a foot thick, because I was going to use the same size, well, 10 inches thick, the same size water bottles, and then stack them, stack them like they're bricks. And wouldn't that be great? And you could fill some of them with water or leave them empty and create light coming in from outside. It wouldn't be a clear window. It would be like going back in time to when you couldn't look out the windows very well, but it's doable. And there are places on the planet that are doing that. And that reminded me that we have a lot of makers here who listen here. And I know people are coming up with all sorts of interesting solutions that can be useful to just real people, but nobody's finding out about them. That's why I found the, the chop wood carry water email to be so useful. But also I gave you a link to a video on the weather channel of a gardening hack, how to use the water from your air conditioning unit. And it just makes me so happy. Like if there's, if there's any way that we can use byproducts in a way that has very little friction in our lives, because friction means we won't do it, very little friction in our lives, then that's awesome. So if you have any more of these things that you know about, things that are being done in your area, things that are happening made by people you know, if you know people who have patented ideas that then got bought up by shell companies that were run by larger oil companies, please share that too. Heather at craftlit.com or you can call 206-350-1642 or go to linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links to the phone, 
to speak pipe if you're out of the country. And I also gave you a bonus video for using oysters as vacuums. I know I did talk about this several years ago when the kids were still in high school. We went down to uh, the Franklin Institute was having a science fair on the street and we saw the students, the eco students at the one of the nearby universities, I think they were from Drexel, demonstrating how to use bivalves. I think they had mussels in their aquariums to show how bivalves can be used to clean the water quite well, quite efficiently, and without harming the bivalves. And I thought, wow, this is really great. I asked them who was doing this on a large scale at the time, and they said no one. Well, within the last year, New York Harbor is doing a lot. I think it's a million oyster project. And they're basically using oysters as vacuums for New York Harbor. Um, they also can help save beaches because as they add to themselves and grow, they can be become reefs, which help stop sand from washing away. So lots of good stuff that's out there. Oh, and the last one that I saw, I just saw this before I started recording. There is a way to make plastic sheeting like uh, cellophane, not like stretchy saran wrap, but like the cello sheets that you would wrap art in or that you might get as a, a packet holding note cards or something like that. Something where the, the plastic doesn't have to be food quality, food grade but gets used all the time and then goes into landfills and then it gets blown around. It can be made from seaweed. And I think she said it doesn't decompose as fast as a piece of lettuce, but it does decompose faster than an ear of corn. Which, I mean, yeah. I know there's potato plastic out there. I had not seen this. And the sheets are absolutely clear. They are not green. <laughs> they don't look like seaweed. They're clear as a bell. So... Yay! There are some good things happening out there. There is also a raffle happening. This is for the Lakoff book, Don't Think of an Elephant. The link to the raffle is in the show notes. And, and yeah, that's going on for, for the month of August. Along with that, our book, definitely for the August book party last Thursday in August, is The Librarian of Burned Books. There'll be a link to that book on the show notes as well. And again, to be part of that book party, all you have to do is go to patreon.com and sign up at the Jane Eyre level. We host the party over on Discord. It's the the place that we've found the fewest streaming glitches and the broadest ability for people to join in and have access to extras as well. So there's that. <sighs> so our chapters today, we're doing chapter 21 and 22. And I have a few things to give you a heads up on before, and then definitely some stuff to talk about afterwards. At the last third, I think, of chapter 21, there is a bit of confusing dialogue. And it's confusing because it gets read very quickly. And because as dialogue, it isn't always because Dumas wants it to go quickly in your head. It isn't always D'Artagnan said, the Duke said. And so you kind of can't follow it necessarily unless the reader is doing very, very distinct voices. That is not true in our free book, and nor is it true in the John Lee version that I've been touting. It's still just as confusing there. So I went back to the original translation to see if there was a problem with the Victorian translation, and the answer is no. It's just a confusing piece of dialogue. And it does contain a phrase, brave as a Scot. That's from Buckingham. And D'Artagnan responds with, brave as a Gascon, which says a lot about what we're supposed to think when we hear brave as a Gascon. Because if, if you aren't aware of what the Scots have done in several wars, Waterloo, 
World War I and World War II, I've given you some links. There's also one of the Chronicle of St. Mary's short stories. It's actually a prequel, and it's read by Jody Taylor, the author. It's called The Very First Damned Thing. Included in there is the Battle of Waterloo, or part of the Battle of Waterloo, including the 92nd, I think they were dragoons, the Highlanders, and their very slow and unstoppable flattening of that particular part of Napoleon's army. It's really quite extraordinary. Jo- Jody Taylor does a lot of research for the historical moments. She also has very, very funny things bookending those historical moments. But the description in that, I think it's only like 25 minutes in to a probably a three and a half hour short story, is really quite moving. There's also a repeated phrase, the end justifies the means. Now, it gets very confusing because, of course, the point we're supposed to come away with is the ends don't justify the means. If we're talking about ethics, uh, it is it is in ethical rules, and I'm putting that in air quotes because, of course, it depends on the philosopher who you're listening to, but the upshot is largely, if you do really bad things for good ends, then did you do a good thing? And plenty of philosophers would say no, and some philosophers would say, yes, the ends do justify the means. It means that people will be rather vicious. And this quote is attributed to Machiavelli, and it's not from Machiavelli. It goes back to Sophocles in 409 BC in the play Electra. It's the end excuses any evil. That's in the Greek. And then Ovid in 10 BC in the Heroides says, oh, I'm probably going to butcher the Latin, exitus ecta probat. The outcome or the result justifies the deeds. And again, this should raise our eyebrows because we should be paying attention. Ooh, is what they said actually true? Is it true that the ends of this next action will justify what you're going to have to do to make that action happen? Then we go to chapter 22, which is uh, referring to a ballet that was written by Louis XIII. Now, I knew that there were different Louis did plays and things. I didn't realize that any of them wrote the music. Louis XIII wrote the music. I've linked out to a couple of reconstructed versions of this ballet and and the music that goes along with it. There's a lot of information that got lost that's been pieced together. It seems really, really interesting and beautiful. And, and yeah, it was kind of a lot of fun to watch the researched videos that they have up. But it's it's all about hunting a blackbird. So, yeah, uh, Louis enjoyed hunting blackbirds. There's a huge description of the buildup to this, which goes absolutely in line with everything I've ever read about the French monarchy's uh, attention to detail on how to throw a party for the king or how the king and queen would expect to have a party be thrown for them, including, and this will make your jaw drop, 200 white candles, white candles being used to illuminate the room. That's a chunk of change right there. There's also a reference to a Madam President. She is the wife of the President of Parliament, and she is apparently held at the same level in society as, like, she's one down from the Queen. So there's Queen, and then there's the president's wife, which I thought was kind of interesting. I did not expect that. There's the phrase collation, which I've never heard used this way. C-O-L-L-A-T-I-O-N is another word for light meal. So there's that. And then you're going to hear several lists of men throughout these chapters, or throughout chapter 22. They are, as we can come to expect from Dumas, real people. In this case, he's pulling all of their names from a contemporaneous written, not transcript, but memoir by a guy who was at the party and knew the people. So Dumas not making them up. However, later on in the chapter, he does throw a couple of people in who wouldn't necessarily have been there yet. Like they're 
either already in the Bastille or they weren't in Paris at the time. But that's neither here nor there. 98% of the people that you hear listed were real dudes and important ones, which is kind of cool. Oh, and the last thing that is book adjacent, we went to see a movie this weekend. We saw Mission Impossible, which is, you know, fun to see in a theater. And we saw a preview for a new film starring Joaquin Phoenix, of all people, playing Napoleon. And I thought, oh, this is perfect. This is where Black Count, this is Alexandre Dumas' father. This is when he was in the mix with Napoleon and being an amazing hot fighting man. And no, I saw him not at all in the preview. I am hurt. (laughs) I am traumatized. I'm saddened. It would have been an awesome opportunity. But then I thought again and went, well, actually, honestly, he would have, just as in real life, completely upstaged Napoleon. So, oh, well. But with that, let's listen to chapters 21 and 22 of The Three Musketeers, written by Alexandre Dumas, read for us by our volunteer, or if you are listening to the John Lee or any other version outside of the Craftlet audio that we provide, you just need to flip to 59 minutes and 26 seconds. And you can tune back in then to hear the post-chapter chat. All right, here we go. Chapter 21 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1. The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Countess de Winter As they rode along, the Duke endeavored to draw from D'Artagnan not all that had happened, but what D'Artagnan himself knew. By adding all that he heard from the mouth of the young man to his own remembrances, he was enabled to form a pretty exact idea of a position of the seriousness of which, for the rest the Queen's letter, short but explicit, gave him the clue. But that which astonished him most was that the Cardinal, so deeply interested in preventing this young man from setting his foot in England, had not succeeded in arresting him on the road. It was then, upon the manifestation of this astonishment, that D'Artagnan related to him the precaution taken, and how, thanks to the devotion of his three friends, whom he had left scattered and bleeding on the road, he had succeeded in coming off with a single sword-thrust, which had pierced the Queen's letter, and for which he had repaid Monsieur de Ward with such terrible coin. While he was listening to this recital, delivered with the greatest simplicity, the Duke looked from time to time at the young man with astonishment, as if he could not comprehend how so much prudence, courage, and devotedness could be allied with a countenance which indicated not more than twenty years. The horses went like the wind, and in a few minutes they were at the gates of London. D'Artagnan imagined that on arriving in town the duke would slacken his pace, but it was not so. He kept on his way at the same rate, heedless about upsetting those whom he met on the road. In fact, in crossing the city two or three accidents of this kind happened— but Buckingham did not even turn his head to see what became of those he had knocked down. D'Artagnan followed him amid cries which strongly resembled curses. On entering the court of his hotel, Buckingham sprang from his horse, and without thinking what became of the animal threw the bridle on his neck and sprang toward the vestibule. D'Artagnan did the same with a little more concern, however, for the noble creatures, whose merits he fully appreciated— but he had the satisfaction of seeing three or four grooms run from the kitchens and the stables and busy themselves with the steeds. The duke walked so fast that D'Artagnan had some trouble in keeping up with him. He passed through several apartments of an elegance of which even the greatest nobles of France had not even an idea, and arrived at length in a bedchamber which was at once a miracle of taste and of richness. In the alcove of this chamber was a door concealed in the tapestry which the duke opened with a little gold key which he wore suspended from his neck by a chain of the same metal. With discretion D'Artagnan remained behind, but at the moment when Buckingham crossed the threshold he turned round, and seeing the hesitation of the young man, "'Come in!' cried he, "'and if you have the good fortune to be admitted to Her Majesty's presence, tell her what you have seen.' Encouraged by this invitation, D'Artagnan followed the duke, who closed the door after them. 
The two found themselves in a small chapel, covered with a tapestry of Persian silk worked with gold, and brilliantly lighted with a vast number of candles. Over a species of altar, and beneath a canopy of blue velvet, surmounted by white and red plumes, was a full-length portrait of Anne of Austria, so perfect in its resemblance that D'Artagnan uttered a cry of surprise on beholding it. One might believe the queen was about to speak. On the altar and beneath the portrait was the casket containing the diamond studs. The duke approached the altar, knelt as a priest might have done before a crucifix, and opened the casket. There, said he, drawing from the casket a large bow of blue ribbon all sparkling with diamonds. There all the precious studs which I have taken an oath should be buried with me. The queen gave them to me. The queen requires them again. Her will be done like that of God in all things. Then he began to kiss, one after the other, those dear studs with which he was about to part. All at once he uttered a terrible cry. "'What is the matter?' exclaimed D'Artagnan anxiously. "'What has happened to you, my lord?' "'All is lost!' cried Buckingham, becoming as pale as a corpse. Two of the studs are wanting. There are only ten. "'Can you have lost them, my lord, or do you think they have been stolen?' "'They have been stolen,' replied the duke. "'And it is the cardinal who has dealt this blow. Hold, see!' The ribbons which held them have been cut with scissors. If my lord suspects they have been stolen, perhaps the person who stole them still has them in his hands. Wait, wait, said the duke. The only time I have worn these studs was at a ball, given by the king eight days ago at Windsor. The Comtesse de Winter, with whom I had quarreled, became reconciled to me at that ball, that reconciliation was nothing but the vengeance of a jealous woman. I have never seen her from that day. The woman is an agent of the cardinal. He has agents, then, throughout the world? cried D'Artagnan. Oh, yes, said Buckingham, grating his teeth with rage. Yes, he is a terrible antagonist. But when is this ball to take place? Monday next? "'Monday next! Still five days before us! That's more time than we want! "'Patrick!' cried the duke, opening the door of the chapel. "'Patrick!' his confidential valet appeared. "'My jeweler and my secretary!' The valet went out with a mute promptitude which showed him accustomed to obey blindly and without reply. But although the jeweler had been mentioned first, it was the secretary who first made his appearance— this was simply because he lived in the hotel. He found Buckingham seated at a table in his bedchamber, writing orders with his own hand. "'Mr. Jackson,' said he, "'go instantly to the Lord Chancellor and tell him that I charge him with the execution of these orders. I wish them to be promulgated immediately.' "'But, my lord, if the Lord Chancellor interrogates me upon the motives which may have led your grace to adopt such an extraordinary measure,' What shall I reply? That such is my pleasure, and that I answer for my will to no man. Will that be the answer, replied the secretary, smiling, which he must transmit to his majesty if, by chance, his majesty should have the curiosity to know why no vessel is to leave any of the ports of Great Britain? You are right, Mr. Jackson, replied Buckingham. He will say, in that case— to the king that I am determined on war, and that this measure is my first act of hostility against France. The secretary bowed and retired. We are safe on that side, said Buckingham, turning toward D'Artagnan. If the studs are not yet gone to Paris, they will not arrive till after you. How so? I have just placed an embargo on all vessels at present in His Majesty's ports, and without particular permission, not one dare lift an anchor. D'Artagnan looked with stupefaction at a man who thus employed the unlimited power with which he was clothed by the confidence of a king, 
in the prosecution of his intrigues. Buckingham saw by the expression of the young man's face what was passing in his mind, and he smiled. Yes, said he, yes, Anne of Austria is my true queen. Upon a word from her, I would betray my country. I would betray my king. I would betray my god. She asked me not to send the Protestants of La Rochelle the assistance I promised them. I have not done so. I broke my word. It is true, but what signifies that? I obeyed my love. And have I not been richly paid for that obedience? It was to that obedience I owe her portrait. D'Artagnan was amazed to note by what fragile and unknown threads the destinies of nations and the lives of men are suspended. He was lost in these reflections when the goldsmith entered. He was an Irishman, one of the most skillful of his craft, and who himself confessed that he gained a hundred thousand livres a year by the Duke of Buckingham. "'Mr. O'Reilly,' said the Duke, leading him into the chapel, "'look at these diamond studs.' and tell me what they are worth a piece. The goldsmith cast a glance at the elegant manner in which they were set, calculated one with another what the diamonds were worth, and without hesitation. Fifteen hundred pistoles each, my lord. How many days would it require to make two studs exactly like them? You see there are two wanting. Eight days, my lord. I will give you three thousand pistoles apiece if I can have them by the day after tomorrow. My lord, they shall be yours. You are a jewel of a man, Mr. O'Reilly, but that is not all. These studs cannot be trusted to anybody. It must be done in the palace. Impossible, my lord. There is no one but myself can so execute them that one cannot tell the new from the old. Therefore, my dear Mr. O'Reilly, you are my prisoner, and if you wish ever to leave my palace, you cannot. So make the best of it. Name to me such of your workmen as you need, and point out the tools they must bring. The goldsmith knew the duke. He knew all objection would be useless, and instantly determined how to act. May I be permitted to inform me, wife? said he. Oh! You may even see her if you like, my dear Mr. O'Reilly. Your captivity shall be mild, be assured, and as every inconvenience deserves its indemnification, here is, in addition to the price of the studs, an order for a thousand pistoles to make you forget the annoyance I cause you. D'Artagnan could not get over the surprise created in him by this minister, who thus open-handed sported with men and millions. As to the goldsmith, he wrote to his wife, sending her the order for the thousand pistoles, and charging her to send him in exchange his most skillful apprentice, an assortment of diamonds, of which he gave the names and the weight and the necessary tools. Buckingham conducted the goldsmith to the chamber destined for him, and which at the end of half an hour was transformed into a workshop. Then he placed a sentinel at each door with an order to admit nobody upon any pretense but his valet de chambre of Patrick. We need not add that the goldsmith O'Reilly and his assistant were prohibited from going out under any pretext. This point settled, the duke turned to D'Artagnan. Now, my young friend, said he, England is all our own. What do you wish for? What do you desire? A bed, my lord, replied D'Artagnan. At present, I confess, that is the thing I stand most in need of. Buckingham gave D'Artagnan a chamber adjoining his own. He wished to have the young man at hand, not that he at all mistrusted him, but for the sake of having someone to whom he could constantly talk of the queen. In one hour after, the ordinance was published in London that no vessel bound for France should leave port, not even the packet-boat with letters. In the eyes of everybody, this was a declaration of war between the two kingdoms. On the day after the morrow, by eleven o'clock, the two diamond studs were finished, and they were so completely imitated, so perfectly alike, that Buckingham could not tell the new ones from the old ones, and experts in such matters would have been deceived as he was. He immediately called D'Artagnan. Here, said he to him, are the diamond studs that you came to bring, 
and be my witness that I have done all that human power could do. Be satisfied, my lord. I will tell all that I have seen. But does your grace mean to give me the studs without the casket? The casket would encumber you. Besides, the casket is the more precious from being all that is left to me. You will say that I keep it. I will perform your commission, word for word, my lord. And now, resumed Buckingham, looking earnestly at the young man, how shall I ever acquit myself of the debt I owe you? D'Artagnan blushed up to the whites of his eyes. He saw that the duke was searching for a means of making him accept something, and the idea that the blood of his friends and himself was about to be paid for with English gold was strangely repugnant to him. Let us understand each other, my lord, replied D'Artagnan, and let us make things clear beforehand in order that there may be no mistake. I am in the service of the king and queen of France, and form part of the company of Monsieur Dessessart, who, as well as his brother-in-law, Monsieur de Treville, is particularly attached to their majesties. What I have done, then, has been for the queen, and not at all for your grace. And still further, it is very probable I should not have done any of this, if it had not been to make myself agreeable to someone who is my lady, as the queen is yours. Yes, said the duke, smiling, and I even believe that I know that other person. It is... My lord, I have not named her, interrupted the young man warmly. That is true, said the duke. And it is to this person I am bound to discharge my debt of gratitude. You have said, my lord, for truly at this moment when there is question of war, I confess to you that I see nothing in your grace but an Englishman, and consequently an enemy whom I should have much greater pleasure in meeting on the field of battle than in the park at Windsor or the corridors of the Louvre, all which, however, will not prevent me from executing to the very point my commission, or from laying down my life, if there need be of it, to accomplish it. But I repeat it to your grace, without your having personally on that account more to thank me for in the second interview than for what I did for you in the first. We say, proud as a Scotsman, murmured the Duke of Buckingham. And we say, proud as a Gascon, replied D'Artagnan. The Gascons are the Scots of France. D'Artagnan bowed to the duke and was retiring. "'Well, are you going away in that manner? Where and how?' "'That's true. For God, these Frenchmen have no consideration.' "'I had forgotten that England was an island, and that you were the king of it. "'Go to the riverside, ask for the brig Sund, and give this letter to the captain. "'He will convey you to a little port.' where certainly you are not expected, and which is ordinarily only frequented by fishermen. The name of the port? St. Valery, but listen, when you have arrived there, you will go to a mean tavern. Without a name and without a sign, a mere fisherman's hut, you cannot be mistaken, there is but one. Afterward? You will ask for the host, and will repeat to him the word... Forward. Which means? Uh, in French, en avant. It is the password. He will give you a horse all saddled, and will point out to you the road you ought to take. You will find, in the same way, four relays on your route. If you will give at each of these relays your address in Paris, the four horses will follow you thither. You already know two of them, and you appeared to appreciate them like a judge. They were those we rode on, and you may rely upon me for the others not being inferior to them. These horses are equipped for the field. However proud you may be, you will not refuse to accept one of them, and to request your three companions to accept the others. That is, in order to make war against us. Besides, the end justified the means, as you Frenchmen say, does it not? Yes, my lord, I accept them said D'Artagnan, and if it please God, we will make a good use of your presence. Well, now, your hand, young man. Perhaps we shall soon meet on the field of battle, but in the meantime, 
we shall part good friends, I hope. Yes, my lord, but with the hope of soon becoming enemies. Be satisfied. I promise you that. I depend upon your word, my lord. D'Artagnan bowed to the duke and made his way as quickly as possible to the riverside. Opposite the Tower of London he found the vessel that had been named to him, delivered his letter to the captain, who, after having it examined by the governor of the port, made immediate preparations to sail. Fifty vessels were waiting to set out. Passing alongside one of them, D'Artagnan fancied he perceived on board it the woman of Meung, the same whom the unknown gentleman had called Milady, and whom D'Artagnan had thought so handsome. But thanks to the current of the stream and a fair wind, his vessel passed so quickly that he had little more than a glimpse of her. The next day, about nine o'clock in the morning, he landed at St. Valery. D'Artagnan went instantly in search of the inn, and easily discovered it by the riotous noise which resounded from it. War between England and France was talked of as near and certain, and the jolly sailors were having a carousel. D'Artagnan made his way through this crowd, advanced toward the host, and pronounced the word, Forward. The host instantly made him a sign to follow, went out with him by a door which opened into a yard, led him to the stable where a saddled horse awaited him, and asked him if he stood in need of anything else. "'I want to know the route I am to follow,' said D'Artagnan. "'Go from hence to Blangy, and from Blangy to Neufchatel. At Neufchatel go to the tavern of the Golden Harrow. Give the password to the landlord. You will find, as you have here, a horse ready saddled.' "'Have I anything to pay?' demanded D'Artagnan. "'Everything is paid,' replied the host, "'and liberally. Begone, and may God guide you.' "'Amen!' cried the young man, and set off at full gallop. Four hours later he was in Neufchatel. He strictly followed the instructions he had received. At Neufchatel, as at St. Valery, he found a horse quite ready and awaiting him. He was about to remove the pistols from the saddle he had quit, to the one he was about to fill, but he found the holsters furnished with similar pistols. "'Your address at Paris.' "'Hotel of the Guards, Company of Dessassade. "'Enough,' replied the questioner. "'Which route must I take?' demanded D'Artagnan in his turn. "'That of Rouen. But you will leave the city on your right. You must stop at the little village of Ecuy, in which there is but one tavern, the Shield of France.' Don't condemn it from appearances. You will find a horse in the stables quite as good as this. The same password? Exactly. Adieu, master. A good journey, gentlemen. Do you want anything? D'Artagnan shook his head and set off at full speed. At Ecuy, the same scene was repeated. He found as provident a host and a fresh horse. He left his address as he had done before, and set off again at the same pace for Pontoise. At Pontoise he changed his horse for the last time, and at nine o'clock galloped into the yard of Treville's hotel. He had made nearly sixty leagues in little more than twelve hours. Monsieur de Treville received him as if he had seen him that same morning. Only when pressing his hand a little more warmly than usual, he informed him that the company of Dessassat was on duty at the Louvre and that he might repair at once to his post. End of chapter 21 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 22 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1 The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas Translated by William Robson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ballet of La Melaison On the morrow... Nothing was talked of in Paris but the ball which the aldermen of the city were to give to the king and queen, and in which their majesties were to dance the famous La Melaison, the favorite ballet of the king. Eight days had been occupied in preparations at the Hotel de Ville for this important evening. The city carpenters had erected scaffolds, upon which the invited ladies were to be placed. The city grocer had ornamented the chambers with two hundred flambeaux of white wax, a piece of luxury unheard of at that period, and twenty violins were ordered, and the price for them fixed at double the usual rate upon condition, said the report, that they should be played all night. At ten o'clock in the morning, the Sir de la Coste 
ensign and the king's guard, followed by two officers and several archers of that body, came to the city registrar named Clement, and demanded of him all the keys of the rooms and offices of the hotel. These keys were given up to him instantly. Each of them had ticket attached to it, by which it might be recognized, and from that moment the Sieur de Lacoste was charged with the care of all the doors and all the avenues. At eleven o'clock came in his turn Duhallier, captain of the guards, bringing with him fifty archers, who were distributed immediately through the Hotel de Ville, at the doors assigned them. At three o'clock came two companies of the guards, one French, the other Swiss. The company of French guards were composed of half of Monsieur Duhallier's men and half of Monsieur Dessassart's men. At six in the evening the guests began to come. As fast as they entered, they were placed in the grand saloon on the platforms prepared for them. At nine o'clock, Madame la Première Présidente arrived. As next to the Queen, she was the most considerable personage of the fête. She was received by the city officials and placed in a box opposite to that which the Queen was to occupy. At ten o'clock, the King's collation, consisting of preserves and other delicacies, was prepared in the little room on the side church of St. Jean, in front of the silver buffet of the city, which was guarded by four archers. At midnight great cries and loud acclamations were heard. It was the king who was passing through the streets which led from the Louvre to the Hotel de Ville, and which were all illuminated with colored lanterns. Immediately the aldermen, clothed in their cloth robes and preceded by six sergeants, each holding a flambeau in his hand, went to attend upon the king, whom they met on the steps where the provost of the merchants made him the speech of welcome, a compliment to which his majesty replied with an apology for coming so late, laying the blame upon the cardinal, who had detained him till eleven o'clock, talking of affairs of the state. His majesty, in full dress, was accompanied by his royal highness, Monsieur le Comte de Soissons, by the grand prior, by the duc de Longueville, by the duc de Boeuf, by the comte d'Arcourt, and by the Comte de la Roche-Guillon, by Monsieur de Liancourt, by Monsieur de Barada, by the Comte de Cramaille, and by the Chevalier de Souveray. Everybody noticed that the king looked dull and preoccupied. A private room had been prepared for the king, and another for Monsieur. In each of these closets were placed masquerade dresses. The same had been done for the queen and madame, the president, the nobles and ladies of their majesty's suites were to dress two by two in chambers prepared for the purpose. Before entering his closet, the king desired to be informed the moment the cardinal arrived. Half an hour after the entrance of the king, fresh acclamations were heard. These announced the arrival of the queen. The aldermen did as they had done before, and preceded by their sergeants advanced to receive their illustrious guest. The queen entered the great hall, and it was remarked that, like the king, she looked dull and even weary. At the moment she entered, the curtain of a small gallery, which to that time had been closed, was drawn, and the pale face of the cardinal appeared, he being dressed as a Spanish cavalier. His eyes were fixed upon those of the queen, and a smile of terrible joy passed over his lips. The queen did not wear her diamond studs. The queen remained for a short time to receive the compliments of the city dignitaries, and to reply to the salutations of the ladies. All at once the king appeared with the cardinal at one of the doors of the hall. The cardinal was speaking to him in a low voice, and the king was very pale. The king made his way through the crowd without a mask, and the ribbons of his doublet scarcely tied. He went straight to the queen, and in an altered voice said, "'Why, madame, have you not thought proper to wear your diamond studs?' when you know it would give me so much gratification. The queen cast a glance around her and saw the cardinal behind with a diabolical smile on his countenance. Sire, replied the queen with a faltering voice, because in the midst of such a crowd as this, I feared some accident might happen to them. And you were wrong, madame. If I made you that present, it was that you might adorn yourself therewith. I tell you that you were wrong. The voice of the king was tremulous with anger. Everybody looked and listened with astonishment and comprehending nothing of what passed. Sire, said the queen, I can send for them to the Louvre where they are, and thus your majesty's wishes will be complied with. Do so, madame, 
Do so, and that at once, for within an hour the ballet will commence. The queen bent in token of submission, and followed the ladies who were to conduct her to her room. On this part the king returned to his apartment. There was a moment of trouble and confusion in the assembly. Everybody had remarked that something had passed between the king and queen, but both of them had spoken so low that everybody, out of respect, withdrew several steps, so that nobody had heard anything. The violins began to sound with all their might, but nobody listened to them. The king came out first from his room. He was in a most elegant hunting costume, and Monsieur and the other nobles were dressed like him. This was the costume that best became the king. So dressed, he really appeared the first gentleman of his kingdom. The cardinal drew near to the king and placed in his hand a small casket. The king opened it and found in it two diamond studs. "'What does this mean?' demanded he of the cardinal. "'Nothing,' replied the latter. "'Only if the queen has the studs, which I very much doubt, count them, sire. And if you only find ten, ask her majesty who can have stolen from her the two studs that are here.' The king looked at the cardinal as if to interrogate him, but he had not time to address any question to him. A cry of admiration burst from every mouth. If the king appeared to be the first gentleman of his kingdom, the queen was without doubt the most beautiful woman in France. It is true that the habit of a huntress became her admirably. She wore a beaver hat with blue feathers, a surtout of gray pearl velvet, fastened with diamond clasps, and a petticoat of blue satin embroidered with silver. On her left shoulder sparkled the diamond studs, on a bow of the same color as the plumes and the petticoat. The king trembled with joy, and the cardinal with vexation. Although, distant as they were from the queen, they could not count the studs. The queen had them. The only question was, had she ten or twelve? At that moment the violins sounded the signal for the ballet. The king advanced toward Madame the President, with whom he was to dance, and his highness monsieur with the queen. They took their places, and the ballet began. The king danced facing the queen, and every time he passed by her he devoured with his eyes those studs of which he could not ascertain the number. A cold sweat covered the brow of the cardinal. The ballet lasted an hour, and had sixteen entrees. The ballet ended amid the applause of the whole assemblage, and every one reconducted his lady to her place, but the king took advantage of the privilege he had of leaving his lady to advance eagerly toward the queen. "'I thank you, madame,' said he, "'for the deference you have shown to my wishes. But I think you want two of the studs, and I bring them back to you.' With these words he held out to the queen the two studs the cardinal had given him. "'How, sire?' cried the young queen, affecting surprise. "'You are giving me then two more. I shall have fourteen. In fact, the king counted them, and the twelve studs were all on her majesty's shoulder. The king called the cardinal. "'What does this mean, Monsieur Cardinal?' asked the king in a severe tone. "'This means, sire,' replied the cardinal, "'that I was desirous of presenting her majesty with these two studs, and that not daring to offer them myself, I adopted this means of inducing her to accept them.' "'And I am the more grateful to your eminence,' replied Anne of Austria with a smile that proved she was not the dupe of this ingenious gallantry. "'From being certain that these two studs alone have cost you as much as all the others cost his majesty.' Then, saluting the king and the cardinal, the queen resumed her way to the chamber in which she had dressed and where she was to take off her costume. The attention which we have been obliged to give during the commencement of the chapter to the illustrious personages we have introduced into it has diverted us for an instant from him to whom Anne of Austria owed the extraordinary triumph she had obtained over the cardinal, and who, confounded, unknown, lost in the crowd gathered at one of the doors, looked on at this scene comprehensible only to four persons, the king, the queen, his eminence, and himself." The queen had just regained her chamber, and D'Artagnan was about to retire, when he felt his shoulder lightly touched. He turned and saw a young woman, who made him a sign to follow her. 
The face of this young woman was covered with a black velvet mask, but notwithstanding this precaution, which was in fact taken rather against others than against him, he at once recognized his usual guide, the light and intelligent Madame Bonacieux. On the evening before, they had scarcely seen each other for a moment at the apartment of the Swiss guard, Germain, whither D'Artagnan had sent for her. The haste which the young woman was in to convey to the queen the excellent news of the happy return of her messenger prevented the two lovers from exchanging more than a few words. D'Artagnan therefore followed Madame Bonacieux, moved by a double sentiment, love and curiosity. All the while, and in proportion as the corridors became more deserted, D'Artagnan wished to stop the young woman, seize her, and gaze upon her, were it only for a minute. But quick as a bird she glided between his hands, and when he wished to speak to her, her finger placed upon her mouth, with a little imperative gesture full of grace, reminded him that he was under the command of a power which he must blindly obey, and which forbade him even to make the slightest complaint. At length, after winding about for a minute or two, Madame Bonacieux opened the door of a closet, which was entirely dark, and led D'Artagnan into it. There she made a fresh sign of silence, and opened a second door concealed by tapestry. The opening of this door disclosed a brilliant light, and she disappeared. D'Artagnan remained for a moment motionless, asking himself where he could be, but soon a ray of light which penetrated through the chamber, together with the warm and perfumed air which reached him from the same aperture, the conversation of two of three ladies in language at once respectful and refined, and the word majesty, several times repeated, indicated clearly that he was in a closet attached to the queen's apartment. The young man waited in comparative darkness and listened. The queen appeared cheerful and happy, which seemed to astonish the persons who surrounded her, and who were accustomed to see her almost always sad and full of care. The queen attributed this joyous feeling to the beauty of the fete, to the pleasure she had experienced in the ballet, and as it is not permissible to contradict a queen, whether she smile or weep, everybody expatiated on the gallantry of the aldermen of the city of Paris. Although D'Artagnan did not at all know the queen, he soon distinguished her voice from the others, at first by a slightly foreign accent, and next by that tone of domination naturally impressed upon all royal words. He heard her approach and withdraw from the partially open door, and twice or three times he even saw the shadow of a person intercept the light. At length a hand and an arm, surpassingly beautiful in their form and whiteness, glided through the tapestry. D'Artagnan at once comprehended that this was his recompense. He cast himself on his knees, seized the hand and touched it respectfully with his lips. Then the hand was withdrawn, leaving in his an object which he perceived to be a ring. The door immediately closed, and D'Artagnan found himself again in complete obscurity. D'Artagnan placed the ring on his finger and again waited. It was evident that all was not yet over. After the reward of his devotion, that of his love was to come. Besides, although the ballet was danced, the evening had scarcely begun. Supper was to be served at three, and the clock of St. Jean had struck three-quarters past two. The sound of voices diminished by degrees in the adjoining chamber. The company was then heard departing. Then the door of the closet in which D'Artagnan was, was opened, and Madame Bonacieux entered. "'You at last!' cried D'Artagnan. "'Silence!' said the young woman, placing her hand upon his lips. "'Silence!' and go the same way you came. But where and when shall I see you again? cried D'Artagnan. A note which you will find at home will tell you. Be gone, be gone. At these words she opened the door of the corridor and pushed D'Artagnan out of the room. D'Artagnan obeyed like a child, without the least resistance or objection, which proved that he was really in love. End of chapter 22 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. All right, so chapter 21 was called The Countess de Winter. I didn't want to say that up front. Buckingham mentions her by that name. D'Artagnan sees Milady on, in England as he is leaving on the boat that 
the Duke of Buckingham arranged for D'Artagnan to go back on. So that's our first hint. It may be our second hint, but it's our first like pretty direct hint that these two women are probably the same person. I also thought it was interesting that the only thing that slows D'Artagnan down on either end of this journey is the governor at the port checking your papers. <laughs> only bureaucracy can stop D'Artagnan. Some things just don't change, right? I also thought it was interesting, the Hotel de Ville, the place where they are throwing this party for Louis and the Queen, that was actually burned, like burned on purpose, like oil was poured on it and it was torched during the French Revolution. Well, during the Commune period. But there is still Hotel de Ville on that spot. And it is a reconstruction of the original, which is kind of cool. I thought was amazingly quick thinking on Richelieu's part. And even better quick thinking on Anne's part for Richelieu to say, I just... I wanted to give her two more diamonds, but I couldn't. I didn't have the nerve. I had to let you, King Louis, do it for me. And then Anne coming back with, And I'm the more grateful to you, your eminence, from being certain that these two studs alone have cost you as much as all the others cost his majesty. Mic drop, and we're out. Thank you, Queen Anne. I, mm, Dumas likes smart women, which makes me happy. All right, I think that's everything. Yes. Send me genius things that you are learning about that people are doing to make the world a better place, and, and I'll share them out with everybody else as well. And for those of you who have already gone to Patreon to sign up to support the show, thank you so much. Especially right now, it means so very much to us. And for those of you who haven't signed up yet, but are planning to, thank you too. All right. I will leave you for the week. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>